have no idea why they picked the oldest guy on the program to give the talk on longevity, <laughs> but uh, it is of some interest to me. Uh, the picture of the lady at her 100th birthday party is probably not what our conclusion is going to be. <laughs> the concept of becoming young easily goes back to the old fountain of youth and Ponce de Leon. Uh, I wondered why nobody in America is named Ponce, but when I looked it up, it means a man who works for a prostitute hustling up business for. <laughs> Where you live in the world has something to do with life expectancy, and the United States is in the second category, not the top. It's kind of hard to tell the orange from the red here, but Canada has better longevity than we do in Japan and Australia. New Zealand. Mexico, the United States, and Libya and Argentina are all about the same. Where you live in the U.S. also has something to do with your ability to live to be old. It seems like we're right in the middle of that belt of low, low longevity. Interestingly, New York State and Hawaii, are, which don't seem to have much in common to me, are the top this is a CDC slide that shows how many years you live after 65. It again shows the same pattern. The pattern is repeated in lots of things, diabetes as well, but it's also the poverty map. The poorer you are, the shorter your life is. The richest 1% of men in America live 14 years longer than the lowest 1% in income. So having enough money makes you live longer. Now, the medical world wants you to think it's because you can afford to go to the doctor. I don't know that that's the answer. It's interesting that I thought life insurance companies would be the way to figure out how to tell life expectancy because their money's on the line. They won't know how long you're going to live. Uh, they used things like how heavy you were what your blood pressure was, what your cholesterol is. Interestingly, cholesterol is inversely related to longevity. The higher your cholesterol, the longer you live. And the lower your cholesterol, the shorter you live. Alcohol in low doses is not negative, but in high doses it is. Traffic violations, I'm pretty sure car wrecks will shorten your life expectancy. Now, the thing that makes you live long are these little guys. Mitochondria live in your cells. They make the energy that you live off of. Chronic disease is always associated with these things not making enough energy. So the more mitochondria you have and the better they work, the longer you're going to live. Mitochondria are pretty interesting because they seem to have come from bacteria originally. Somehow bacteria teamed up with other cells, and they created the ability for multicelled organisms to live. They make the power, which is basically electrons. Mitochondria make 160 pounds of ATP a day, or at least up to that much. The life of ATP is milliseconds, so it doesn't live very long, but it's, it's how you shift electrons around. Interestingly, your mitochondrial DNA comes from your mother only, not from both parents, different than nuclear DNA. I think that's what Ancestry.com is all about. Anyway, my, when your mitochondria quit working, you die. Many things poison them, and these pretty little things on the right that we've been told will cure everything are some of the poisons. Two mitochondrial poisons you might recognize it from your own practice are statins and metformin. Many other mitochondrial poisons are out there, and inflammation is one of them. When you get the flu and you get inflamed and you feel tired, it's because your mitochondria don't make enough energy. Pesticides, very common in our food supply, are poisonous. Glyphosate, Universal in America, in every person in America's bloodstream, is a super toxin. 
preservatives, things found in crackers, hot dogs, many things in the grocery store are poisonous. Fluoride dumped in our water supply is a poison to your mitochondria. Chlorine, of course, is a poison to everything. Smoking cigarettes hurts your mitochondria. Heavy metals such as mercury and dysbiosis of the gut, which Bruce talked about today. Now, if you want to have stronger and more mitochondria, which would seem to be a way to get to live longer, you need to have as much brown fat as possible. All you got to do is take a hatchet, chop a hole in a lake when it's covered with ice and jump in. Cold thermogenesis, it's called. Your body's forced to create heat in this situation, and it does that, it adapts to that by creating more mitochondria and more effective mitochondria. Brown fat, which is variable in your body as to how much you have, but it's br the fat cells are brown because they have so many mitochondria in them. This guy's named Wim Hof. Wim Hof is an interesting guy, and if you want to know about cold thermogenesis, you can just pull him up on your phone and it'll tell you more than you want to know. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't know how everyone's laughing, but uh, <laughs> I guess it's blacky. That's what I figured. Anyway, this is what cold water bathing looks like in Arkansas. A little, a little different. But that tub came from the feed store, of course. Now, certain things enhance mitochondrial function. And anything that detoxes you, gets rid of heavy metals, get rid of pesticides, will help you. And saunas help you get rid of those things by making you sweat. Ketosis is great for your mitochondria. They're more efficient. They make cleaner energy. And they're due to fat burning. Cold thermogenesis, I mentioned. Fasting is very good for your mitochondria. And supplements sold heavily for mitochondrial function may be good. Uh, $3 billion worth of supplements are bought in America every year, and most of them are for this. Now, if you want to know about supplements, Dave Asprey's book has a long list of supplements that are good for your mitochondria. This whole book is about mitochondrial function relative to how your brain works. Anyway, Dave is the bulletproof coffee guy. Now, saunas, there's some pretty good evidence are really good for you. There was a Finnish study which was carried out for over 20 years with men between 50 and 70. They compared guys that took one sauna a week to guys that took seven saunas a week. They use really high temperature saunas in, in Finland. The times they weren't, didn't think were as significant as whether you just got in the sauna or not. Alcohol didn't mix well but they were able to show an all-cause mortality of 40% less if you took seven saunas a week as compared to one. It also reduced sudden death and cardiovascular mortality. Saunas in Finland are wood-fired, and over here we have infrared saunas. It's the feeling that infrared saunas may be better because infrared light or infrared heat is also something that stimulates your mitochondria. Cold water contrast bathing where you'd get in the sauna and get in the cold water didn't, wasn't mentioned in this article. Endothelial function is felt to be helped because of the vasodilatation you get with sauna. Another thing that's good for mitochondria is exercise. Many people have referred to it here today. You can overdo exercise and become highly inflammatory. If you do, you've overshot and it'll hurt your mitochondria. Try to exercise without getting a lot of inflammation. Exercise can increase your number of mitochondria as well as their efficiency. The VO2, which is your ability to use oxygen, can be increased by up to 40% by training your muscle cells. Carb loading is not the way to go if you're gonna go do long distance running. You need to, you need to be a fat burner when you do that. Toxins, this is a great book on toxins. It's written by a naturopath, but if you're interested in toxins and how to get rid of them, this is a good book. Movie stars also write about toxins. Probably one of the bigger toxins in America is glyphosate. Glyphosate is called Roundup, and nowadays 
they have a new poison that's better called dicamba. These basically are things that kill everything they touch. And they kill bacteria in your gut, they kill fungi in your gut, and they kill plants and no telling what else they kill. They're considered to be carcinogenic in some states. Uh, they're massively in our food supply because wheat is sprayed with glyphosate just before it's taken out of the field. So everything that looks like wheat in America has glyphosate in it. Um, unfortunately, beer and wine's on the list because they come from grain. And the wine thing comes from just spraying weeds in the vineyards. Every American has glyphosate in their body, and Europe does not allow glyphosate. Somehow they've been able to exist without this. This is my urine level of glyphosate which I was pretty proud of, although I wish it was zero. But everybody here, the American average you can see below, and I don't have the units there, but everybody has glyphosate in their blood, and it's thanks to Monsanto. You can send them contributions if you like. Our government sends them massive contributions. They call it the farm bill. Anyway, another thing good for your body, your longevity, and your mitochondria is fasting. Now, many people would say fasting doesn't make you live longer, but it sure makes it seem like it was longer. <laughs> it's not a new concept. Isaiah 58 refers to fasting as part of the Jewish religion in 700 B.C. Daniel, which Dr. Hyman already talked about the Daniel diet, he asked for a limited diet for his health. It's a great inexpensive treat for, for disease. As a matter of fact, it costs nothing. You save money if you fast. Diabetes, type 2 diabetes specifically, very effectively treated with fasting. Many authors say one week of fasting, your type 2 diabetes will be gone. At least your insulin requirement will be gone. You can do fasting in a lot of different ways. There's a 382-day fast been chronicled. I don't recommend it. If you want to know more about fasting, this book is a great little book written by a Canadian doctor. One thing that's been known for a long time is caloric restriction is associated with living longer. It's kind of a takeoff of fasting, but if you take mice and feed them less food, they live up to 40% longer. So. Eating low amounts of calories, good for your longevity. Ketogenic diet, I think, is good for you and good for your, good for your mitochondria. Fluoride is a poison. It's added to most water in the United States. It's not used in Europe. Sodium fluoride is used to treat, used to be used to treat hyperthyroidism in America, but it can cause hypothyroidism, which has something to do with why Americans have 12% rate of hypothyroidism as compared to 6% in Europe. This is what I drink. There's no chloride and there's no fluorine in Mountain Valley water, which of course comes from hot springs. Infrared light could be really good for your mitochondria and it's something I don't know enough about to tell you the details, but infrared light is used by a lot of professional athletes for injuries and things like that, but it's thought to be a mitochondrial enhancer. Now, the formula for how to live long is move to another country where they live longer. And that would basically mean go to where they have a better diet and less glyphosate and other poisons in the diet. I'm not sure where that is. If you become rich, you're supposed to live longer. If you ate less, especially less carbs, there's good evidence you'll live longer. If you can decrease toxins in your life, that'll help you. Exercise is great for you. Sauna and cold exposure, pretty good evidence that they're helpful for health. And if you pick the right parents, you may live to be older. Thank you all.